Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Turfgrass Epistemology. My name is Travis Shaddix. I hope you're doing well. It is election day, November 7th, 2023. I hope everybody has time to get out and vote. I hope you all vote, even if we have differences of political positions. Get out and vote. I do not agree with compulsory voting. There's some people, I think it was maybe in the Obama administration, I don't even remember. There were some ideas floating around about making it a requirement to vote. Maybe I'm wrong on that. I don't want to be wrong. I don't know political stuff, but I will say this. My wife comes from a country where voting is compulsory. And it is, in my opinion, one of the major sources of problems for that country being Brazil. In Brazil, you must vote. You don't have a choice. If you don't vote, they, the government will begin to limit your ability to, to move, meaning your passport will be, you'll, you'll, you'll get caught with your passport if you try to leave the country or if you go travel, your, your driver's license and various other ways that the government will start to kind of shut you down, <laughs> I guess. If you don't vote, you have to vote or you have to provide a, an explanation as to why you did not vote. And the problem, this sounds good in theory, but the problem with that is that in a country like Brazil, where the poverty and the, and the, and the literacy, and literacy rate is so high, the literate, knowledgeable, intelligent population is a very small voting block. And so the elected officials tend to be elected by a large portion of illiterate, um, less than knowledgeable people. So I'm saying that to say this is that you probably don't want everybody to vote. <laughs> I don't want everybody to vote. I want you to vote if you are knowledgeable, if you're interested in voting, if you take the time to read the ballot before you go in or take the time to read the ballot while you're in, um, have, a, have a good reason for who you're voting for, even if we disagree, even if you and I disagree on your political position. Um, I, I want you to vote as long as you're interested and motivated and you want to go vote, but to require people to vote, you're going to get a, a you know, that was it? 60%, 65% of the American population votes. You're going to get the other 35% to vote. Those are the 35% are apparently aren't interested in going and voting. <laughs> I don't think you want them to go vote. Look at Brazil. It's a disaster down there where you have, you know, the, un, the, uh, less than educated people, less than knowledgeable people, um, ruling and running the country in terms of their voting block. And it's a mess. We get a lot of Brazilians leaving the country because it's, uh, it's such a, a mess down there. And I believe my position is, is that it is um, a result primarily of you people have to vote. You don't have a choice. And, um, I want you to vote if you're intelligent and you're interested and you're passionate and you take the time, not, not because the government tells you you have to. <laughs> All right. Anyway, today's voting, go out and vote. As soon as I get done here, I'm going to have lunch with my kids and go vote here. And I don't know if it's, I don't remember this being the case in Florida, but then again, my kids were young when I was in Florida, but here in Kentucky, the kids are out of school for voting day. But I don't know how I feel about that. I mean, it's good that they are their kid. The children are now aware. They're they're very aware. Today's the day to go vote. I didn't really have that when I was a kid. So I guess it's nice that they know it's voting day. But for parents who stay home or parents who work, now you got to stay home and take these kids with you to the voting booth, which is fine, so they can learn to vote and learn what the process is. I, I that's important. But um. You know, it's a bit of a challenge when you, <laughs> when you have, uh, you know, schedules and plans and things like that, you gotta, gotta change your plan around. So I have both my kids in the house right now and I've asked them to kind of keep it down while I go through this. So we'll see how it goes, but don't be surprised if, um, if, you know, a kid runs in here and I gotta hit the be right back button to, to go take care of a little one. So that's that. <clears throat> Go vote. 
Okay, today was going to be th thatch, and depending on how this goes, I may, what I might do is do this brief, this show, I don't know if it's going to be brief or not, about a different topic, and then if it goes for an extended period, then I'll just stop it and then start thatch tomorrow. But if it ends quickly, then what I'll do is I'll close this stream, this episode, and then op immediately open another one like today <clears throat> to discuss thatch because uh, I need two different episodes and I have no idea how to edit it and split them apart and then reload them as videos and stuff like that. I don't do that. So um, we'll see how it goes today. Um, thank you all for being here. Polo, Lawn Radiance, Chad, Mitch Bird, Lush Lawns, Looney. I guess, I guess Looney has to go. He'll be back later. Maybe Gray, Randy, I see you all here. Thank you for all for showing up. We're going to do a video today and, um, it might be a little bit different than what you think it, um, I'm going to talk about. We'll see what happens. I, uh, we finished our fall fertility topic and, uh, coincidentally the last, uh, paper we did yesterday, I guess it was, we talked about organic and inorganic nitrogen sources in Canada and that paper along with, well, I don't know, one or two other papers, you can go back and, and look at them have shown pretty clearly that the inorganic forms of nitrogen in the fall are a little bit more efficient than the, the organic forms of nitrogen in the fall for cool season grasses. Um, don't really give you the response that you're looking for. And the, the general consensus is, is that it simply is just too cold for those organic nitrogen sources to, to release their nitrogen to get a turf response. And in fact, the last paper from Canada even said in the conclusions that after two on well, a year or two of doing the organic, they were adding inorganic nitrogen to an organic sort of summer blend sort of thing. Um, after several years of getting no response, except from the inorganic, they just closed the program down. They closed the study down. <clears throat> in fact, I can find that real quick because I want to make sure that we're clear as to where I'm, where I'm coming from on this. Um, the, this was the, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna bring it on, on screen here, but I'll just read the last little blurb at the, on the conclusions I had it highlighted. It said, because this was a study done on inorganic and organic nitrogen sources in, in Saskatchewan. And it says, because of the lack of spring color response, so they were doing organic and they were doing an organic and inorganic, uh, blend through the summer. And then they were, they were substituting their organic nitrogen for inorganic nitrogen and some treatments. And they said, because of the lack of spring color response, when the inorganic organic combination nitrogen were used and the relative low scores in fall, except when inorganic nitrogen was used in the final application. The experiment was terminated. So in other words, they weren't getting a response from the organic nitrogen source. Um, they weren't getting a response from the organic nitrogen source in the spring. And they weren't getting one in the fall unless there was an inorganic form of nitrogen included. And so they just shut it down. They just weren't getting what they want. And, the, and I guess, as I said, the, the general idea or the thought process is, is that the cold temperatures just simply don't allow for the organic nitrogen to mineralize at a rate that the turf grass can actually take it up and respond to, whether it's in the fall or the spring. That was in Canada. There was another paper or two that we discussed um, that were not in Canada that generally showed similar results. So this is the reason why, one justification why we recommend using inorganic nitrogen in the fall on cool season grasses and not applying organic nitrogen, particularly late in the fall, either sources should not be used. Whether it's soluble or, or if it's going to be used, it's going to be used at very low rates of soluble in. Okay. So there's reasons and justifications as to why we have these best management practices. And I think just coincidentally, a, a YouTuber came on and posted a video yesterday. I think it was yesterday. Um, showing the opposite. <clears throat> I'm not showing it, but recommending the opposite. 
And I wanted to show the video, um, not as a means to criticize this man, but because it was, it was, um, posted in a, um, it was, it was posted and there were some, a, a few, um, critical comments made about the person and, um, his approach. And I wanted to use this as an opportunity to explain or introduce, um, logical fallacies in arguments. So we're going to watch and we're, and we're going to go over all the fallacies at some point. I wasn't even going to do this today, but it popped up and it was a good opportunity for me to kind of broach the topic. So we're going to watch this video in its entirety and we'll kind of, we may go back and discuss it a little bit here and there, but I'm going to have a take on this that might be different than what you are expecting. So see if I can get this on. And as always, uh, my internet <laughs> computer issues might show up, but let's see. I'll just play it. It's only two minutes and 45 seconds long. I'll play it without stopping and then we'll, we'll discuss it afterwards. So what I like to do for, oh, so for those of you listening, this video is a video of a man. I don't know his name. The, the YouTube channel is called turf mechanic and it's called why organic fertilizers in November are not wasteful. And he's sitting out in front of his, I'm assuming his yard on his driveway on a bench and he's just discussing. Um, he's not really showing anything. He's just talking to the video or winterization as temperatures drop well below 50 degrees, especially this is very pertinent for cool season grasses. If you have a cool season lawn and your grass is green in the month of November, but your soil temperatures are below 50 degrees, throw down an organic fertilizer, some sort of naturally sourced nitrogen fertilizer. I've done this for a, for a good long time and I've touted this on a number of videos on the channel. I do get a little bit of kickback from people saying, why would you do that? It's a waste because uh, soil bacteria is largely dormant at that stage, so it's not going to break the product down. The thing that people don't realize or think about is the, the cool season dis, uh, decomposers in the lawn is not soil bacteria. During the cold season, it's fungal decomposers, and fungal decomposers are active in the cold weather. They just work much slower. So if you put down natural fertilizers in cold weather, the fungal decomposers will slowly break these products down over the course of the next three months or so, four months or so. Depending on how cold it is, it will slow down further, but it will still happen. If you put these natural products down in the month of November when soil temperatures drop enough, the nitrogen and the nutrients that are in these products aren't going to be lost. So if you put urea down, it's going to gas off. If you put down synthetic fertilizers after grass has gone dormant, it will slowly leach out of the system. Uh, these are nutrient losses. But if you put down a natural fertilizer, it's just going to sit there. It's like bound up in this organic matter and fungal activity is slowly going to make them plant a bill. It's going to break them down. It's going to take long enough to break them down that by the time spring rolls around, you'll have less nutrient loss than any other form of fertilizer. And at that point, your spring growth, so grass, I've said this many times on this channel and a variety of videos is during the early parts of spring and the end of winter, your grass actually comes out of dormancy from the root first. So the root comes out of the out of dormancy, starts growing, coming alive again, so to speak, before the top growth starts greening up and growing. If the nutrients are in the soil and they have been broken down by that fungal decomposer category of organism, then uh, the grass is gonna be able to start feeding significantly earlier in the season than if we did any other thing. I, I mean, I suppose you could throw down synthetic fertilizer late February, early, early March, but most people aren't gonna do that. That's my long-winded thoughts about winterizing fertilizers. The, the full winterizer video is linked down in the description below. Okay, so I, I watched the full video. I don't know if you've done that or not, but I've watched the full video. And um, I clicked on the link down there and watched the full video. <clears throat> so what the gentleman basically, and I'll get back to that in a second. What the gentleman is basically saying is, do the complete opposite of what the literature we've been talking about is, is recommending. Don't put down soluble nitrogen in the, in the November, December, and don't put down organic, or, but do put down organic nitrogen. Now, 
what I wanted to talk about is when something like this happens, th this is, this channel is turf grass epistemology. Okay. How do we know what we know? And there's a certain, um, expectation, I guess, from people who engage in epist the, you know, epistemology. And that is a bit of, um, skeptical thinking, um, critical, critical thinking. Uh, and so, so, and we're going to start learning how to form arguments and, and what is a good argument and not a good argument. But when, when people, um, when you see this video and you now know, if you've watched some of my videos, um, what the evidence indicates is opposite of what this gentleman is saying, it may be easy or you might be quick to, uh, criticize this gentleman in, in, in a way that is uh, personal to him. You may make comments about him as a person, him, his looks or his intelligence or um, whoever, you know, whatever, a, a personal attack against him saying, and I'm, and I don't know the gentleman's name. I would use it if I knew it. I don't know his name, but say his, say his name is, just call him mechanic. He just thinks turf mechanic. Say if you said, oh, mechanic is a moron or mechanic is an idiot or he, you don't, don't believe him is, is uh, what he's saying isn't true because he's he's uneducated or he's an idiot. He's not committing a fallacy. You're the one committing the fallacy if you do that. Okay. An ad hominem attack is not a valid refutation of an argument. If you call him names as it, as a means to attempt to refute his argument or counter his argument or his position, you're the one at flawed, not him. Okay. So let me explain what an ad hominem is and what an ad hominem attack is not. If you call the man crazy, if you call the man a moron, an idiot, whatever derogatory term you want to use about him as a person, he has an ugly hat or his beard's messed up, whatever you want to do, that is not an ad hominem attack. Okay. You're just, you're just being a dick basically is what you're doing. Okay. You're just being a jerk. If you're calling in juvenile, juvenile, you know, attacks against a person, a human being. However, if you say his argument or his position or his claim is not true because he's a moron or because he's an idiot or whatever the case is, then that is an ad hominem fallacy. Okay. There's a difference between calling someone names and saying his argument is untrue because he is whatever. Okay. So <clears throat> just keep that in mind as we continue to grow and, and gain knowledge on, you know, Socratic method of questioning and epistemological reasoning is that he is clearly uh, not knowledgeable on these issues. Okay. Clearly he's, he's misinformed. He's not using sound logic and the evidence to support his position, but calling the man names, and doing it in a way that is attempting to refute his argument is putting you in the position of, of committing the fallacy, not him. All right. Now that's, so that's the ad hominem attack or fallacy. So we, we're going to eventually start to learn how to, or we, maybe you already know how to do it. I'm maybe I'm late to the game, but I'm going to eventually start going over the various ways to form an argument in such a way that it's structurally sound and hopefully without flaw, you're not committing a known flaw in your argument. We have to, re we have to separate the man making the claim or woman making the claim from the actual claim itself in order to have a civil discourse. Okay. If you want to create an enemy, tell him he's wrong. Telling me he's ugly, T make an attack against him personally. That's a really good way to make an enemy. These, these, uh, this population that exists on the fringe of reality isn't going to come back to the middle by ridiculing them and, you know, shunning them and making fun of them. You know, we, we need these people to come back to the center, to come back to, um, you know, to reality, to, to, 
following the evidence. Come, and what I mean by the center is following the evidence to make your best decision that you can. And in order to do that, we have to empathize with them to some degree. You know, we ha we have to use, um, in my and this is my opinion, we 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 need to use sound reasoning and structured civil discourse rather than personal attacks against against them because that's generally just going to push them further away okay if we go to the extreme and we use something that's I, I would hope nearly everybody listening to this will agree with and the, and see where we go so if if we all agree that the earth is a is an oblate spheroid and it's not flat let's assume that it's it's we agree that it's a oblate spheroid we have a population of people that believe the earth is flat okay ridiculing them as humans and shunning them and making fun of them and you know and all these things isn't going to bring them back to our societal norms of understanding that the earth is an oblate spheroid it's not going to do that it's just going to probably they're going to be met with an initial hesitation and fierce resistance to to you know, you're calling me names, so I'm going to buck up and defend myself. Okay. It's not, it's going to make it more challenging. We need these people. They're part of our society. They're part of our, our, um, communities. This man probably, I don't know how many videos, how many, he has 40,000 subscribers. How many view? He has over a thousand views in less than a day on this video, apparently. So it, I think that's what I'm looking at. So he's, I thought it was higher than that, but a thousand views. So a thousand people have watched this video and are being influenced by this man's flawed reasoning. <clears throat> so you can attack him. You can call him names. You can call him whatever you want. You can have that juvenile approach if you choose to do that. Um, I choose to do it differently. I'm, I'm, I'm going to uh, approach, and I always I, I approach people like this and their claims like this in a way that I, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, how can I get this person to come back to the center, come back to following the evidence um, in a way that is, is constructive for my community and for my society that I live in? And it's generally not calling them names. Okay. I understand, believe me, I get the, the, I get the value of ridicule and I understand making fun of certain things can, can have a beneficial impact. For example, he has thousands of views on this video. If ridiculing him and making fun of him gets him to take the video down and it gets him to whatever, and, and it doesn't influence those thousands of people any longer that have watched the video. And now, now that information is no longer having a negative, um, influence on the viewers, then maybe there's, you could argue that the, you know, ridicule and, and, you know, personal criticisms had a positive impact on our on our communities because now those people watching the video no longer can watch the video because he took it down. So you, you ridiculed one man and you influence potentially thousands in a positive way because they're no longer subject to that misinformation. I get that. There's YouTube channels for that people, other, you know, there's plenty of opportunity for other people to do that. Okay. Knock yourself out. If you want to do that, my approach is different. I feel it's important regardless of who the person is to understand that the person is a human being. He's been misinformed in this case. He's been misled. Um, he's misunderstanding the system. He, I watched the video after that he mentioned at the end of the um, presentation, at the end of his video, I watched the next video. Clearly the man is not knowledgeable on, um, on soil nitrogen transformation, such as denitrification. He conflates ammonification with denitrification and, and he, he's clearly not well informed. Um, but <laughs> ridiculing him isn't going to help. Help, you know, you know, politely and kindly approaching him and trying to get him to come back to the middle to understand, help understand and be more knowledgeable on the systems might help. But I'm just saying, you know, you want to create an enemy, call him, call him, you know, names. Call, tell him he's wrong. That's the way to create an enemy. That's the way to push him further away from the center. Okay. So that's the ad hominem when you're trying to use personal attacks to refute the argument. It's not a valid approach. And um, I would hope that as a community watching this video, we, we learn that um, the claim is different than the claimant. And um, 
and attacking, fiercely attacking, with unapologetically attacking the claim is highly encouraged. Attack his claim, criticize his claim, criticize my claims, criticize the dis discussion and results and conclusions of scientific literature fiercely and without remorse. But when it comes to the human being, that's where I personally draw the line. I don't um, condone that behavior, and I don't think it's constructive or beneficial to our, to our society, our community. He's a human being just like me. I recognize him as, as equal to me in that, in that regard. And um, I hope that we, we uh, consider that as we, as we move forward. Now, I wanted to um, broach a second flaw in potential reasoning. And I don't want to presuppose that any of you all would do this. But it's very easy to fall into this trap. And I want to, I want to mention it here. And that is when you watch a video like this and you, um, you now know if you've watched the uh, videos on my channel that there's plenty of published literature that refutes his claim. You watch the video and he says, don't, he says, don't put down soluble, which I agree. Don't put down soluble in November, and December when the grass is dormant. Don't do that. But he says to put down organic during that time frame, basically when the turf grass is no longer growing, put down these organics or as it's shutting down, put down these organics. And we now know that the organics in many cases um, do not result in a spring flush as we showed just yesterday on the, on the paper from yesterday. We know this and, and in, depending on your location, you'll have similar, very likely have similar results. So when you see these videos, it's very easy to fall into the trap of thinking, hey, I know of evidence to refute this person's claim. I should go do that. I should go, hey, Dr. Shattuck showed a, uh, uh, an article, a research article. I'm going to go find that article, which was in Canadian Journal of Plant Science, and there's two or three other ones in American journals. I'm going to get that article and show him that he's wrong. Show him that this, this, this published literature indicates that it, what he said is incorrect. That is a very easy trap to fall into. You don't need to do that. Okay. You're assuming the burden of proof when you do that. You do not need to assume the burden of proof to refute somebody who has not provided any evidence to support his claim to begin with. It's his responsibility if he wants to convince anybody besides the, you know, the poorly educated, I guess, or the you know, the less informed people, if you want to convince somebody, it's up to the claimant to provide the evidence to support that claim. Not, it's not up to me to provide the evidence to refute it. Okay. He has not in this video, as you, as you saw, I can play it again. If you like, let me know. He provided absolutely no evidence to support his claim. He just said, do this. You should you should do this. Fung fungus are more active in, in the cooler temperature, which is, which is true from my understanding. Fungus is more active than bacteria and fungus will break it down and all these other things. And the nitrogen will be mineralized over, uh, over the winter and they'll be available. He just made claims. There's no evidence whatsoever. I mean, because he provided no evidence, there's no good reason for me to believe it. Therefore, I don't have to go make, uh, to go get evidence or go get another paper to refute it. You're assuming the burden of proof and you're already on the defensive when you do that. Okay, so please do not fall into the, the burden of proof trap. And just because you now know there's evidence that refute it, you should go get it and show it that he's wrong. Okay, there's no evidence to indicate that he's right. He provided no evidence to indicate that, what, that he's correct. So I don't have to prove, provide any evidence to show that he's incorrect. So my position hasn't changed. He provided no evidence. Okay. I hope that makes sense to people. When there is no evidence to support your claim, then there is no good reason to believe it. All right. So those are two key, um, flawed reasons, fallacies in, in our world, the, um, ad hominem attack and the burden of proof fallacy. When you, when you engage in the, the ad hominem, you engage in personal attacks as a means to refute his argument, just understand that you're the one that's flawed. You're the one with the flawed argument, not him. And when you assume, you say, oh, I'm going to send you this email, I'm going to show you what, that you're wrong. When you do that, you're assuming the burden of proof. 
Okay. So how do we, how do we approach it? What is the best way? What is, what is an effective way of, of, you know, combating this flawed, you know, approach this, these YouTubers who do this? Well, I don't know. I don't have the answer, but I do know that subscribing to this channel or other channels that show evidence and provide scientific literature, you know, I guess whatever it is, hitting the bell icon and sharing these videos to get these, this information out to the masses can't hurt. In other words, he has an audience that is receiving misinformation. I have an audience that's receiving, I feel evidence-based information. Okay. So getting this information and not just me, other channels that provide evidence-based information as well, getting that information out, share that information, like those, like those videos. Let's try to, you know, from a grassroots perspective, get this information out to a wider audience so that the audience understands, Hey, there's not just YouTubers out sitting in their lawn, feeding you a bunch of nonsense so they can get their subscribers and their views up high so they can make 50 bucks on a two minute video. There's also evidence-based approaches to turf grass and management and lawn care management and golf and so forth. There's also that it might be a little dry. <laughs> it wouldn't be the first time I've been accused of being dry, being a little monotone and less than interesting, but the content's there. The point is not about me. The point is about the, the, the papers that I'm going over, how to find it. The information is there. It takes sometimes, unfortunately, a little bit of effort to go find the truth. You got to do a Google Scholar search. You got to do a turf grass information file search. Sometimes you you can't just you know watch the you know watch a thirty second video and gain you know sound information. Sometimes you sometimes you got to put a little effort into it. Okay, but it's it's out there. You can find it. Okay, that's all I had. Ten. It's it's uh, we're thirty four minutes in, and I wanted to go over a um, introduce thatch. So what I'm going to do is, this is going to really screw people up, but I don't really know of an inter, another way to do this because I have zero knowledge on how to take one video and split it into two. <laughs> By the way, if anybody wants to uh, do a fair amount of work for absolutely no money and, and help me out with my IT incompetency, then you're welcome to, to volunteer. <laughs> okay, I'm going to shut this thing down and I'm going to immediately open up the thatch video. We're going to start talking about thatch today. We also have an author coming on Thursday, this uh, Thursday morning, and we have another author coming on next Tuesday afternoon. So we have a couple authors coming on in the near future. Um, but I'm going to, I'm going to say goodbye on this stream. I'm going to immediately open up another one. Give me about six or seven minutes. You'll see that you'll see the, the new uh, stream pop up on my channel about thatch. And we're going to start learning a little bit about what thatch is and um, why it is an issue for turf grass management. All right, guys, thanks so much for watching. Uh, as soon as it ends up, check the channel. Give me six, seven minutes to load up the, the, the stream and I'll be right back on. Thanks guys, bye.